Well, Smash Ultimate's DLC has finally come to an end. With the release of Sora, there are no more new characters coming to the game. Smash Ultimate's additions to the roster have been the by far most exciting out of any Smash game, and that's of course seen the most in its DLC. There were 11 total characters added within Fighter Passes 1 and 2, those being Joker, Hero, Banjo, Terry, Byleth, Min Min, Steve, Sephiroth, Pyra, Kazuya, and Sora. These characters range from being just okay to being some of the most legendary gaming icon Smash has ever seen. So to celebrate this game's insane accomplishments, I'm going to rank all the Smash Ultimate's DLC Challenger packs from the worst to the best. Now this isn't just about the characters, though they are of course the most important part. Who the character is and their gaming status will have a huge role to play in how much I like their inclusion. Of the 11 franchises, I've only played one of their games, so I'm mostly free of any strong personal attachment. Mostly. On top of that though, their moveset is also pretty important to consider. After their hype has gone down, are they still a character worth playing? Now I did mention that the characters are not the only thing, as the challenger packs also come with spirits, music, and a stage. Spirits won't change my opinion for any of these rankings, but the other two aspects are also quite important. The number of music tracks and how good those music tracks are will play a huge role in the pack's ranking. The stage also needs to be fun to fight on, or at least really good to look at as I prefer to play on Final Destination most of the time. Also, you may have noticed that I haven't mentioned Piranha Plant yet. I'm not including him in this ranking since this is based on the character packs as a whole and he came to the game as a bonus. I'll do a quick mention of where I'd place him based on his moveset, but he won't be getting his own numbered ranking. It's also important to say, this is obviously just my opinion, and if you disagree, then that's great. So with all of that said, make sure to leave a like and subscribe if you enjoy, but let's jump right into ranking all 11 DLC character packs for Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. And I'm sure you can guess who the first one is. <laughs> Alright, I bet you all didn't see that coming based on how much shade I've thrown Byleth, however I do genuinely think that Challenger Pack 9, Pyramithra, is the worst one to come to Smash Ultimate. Granted, it's not by a lot, but I do think it just barely nudges out Byleth for being the worst. First, the character, or in this case, characters. Pyra and Mithra, who I'll be collectively calling Pythra to annoy people for the rest of the video, were one of the three characters from an already represented franchise in the DLC. In general, characters from new franchises are more exciting because, well, they're from a new franchise, which gives fans of those games a character to finally play as. With Pythra being from Xenoblade, they already had Shulk to represent them, meaning their inclusion as characters were not very exciting. This is also not helped by the fact they're owned by Nintendo, which generally also hampers a character's reveal since it's the crossover aspect of Smash that makes people so excited. Obviously, Nintendo characters can and have been extremely hype, but they usually aren't groundbreaking like the third parties. To give Pythra some credit though, they weren't as bad of a pick as Byleth was, whose franchise was already oversaturated long before them. Alright, so the character wasn't great, but what about their moveset? Well, like their initial reveal, this is very lame. It's no secret at this point that, at least at the time of writing this, Pythra is the strongest character tier list wise added in the second pass. They are incredibly easy to use characters, especially Mithra. All of her attacks come out super fast, meaning that you can combo pretty much anything together with no real thought. Her sword though really does not feel impactful at all, making their combo some of the least interesting to perform and watch out of the entire cast. Pyra's sword definitely packs more of a punch, however she doesn't really have any combos that go on for more than two hits. Even with their special switching mechanics, they just aren't that fun to play. Luckily the recovery is trash, so I haven't really gone against any Pythra that has annoyed me yet. As a Kirby player, using stone on Mithra's side special is very satisfying and easy to do. These two are easily my least favorite sword fighters to play as in the game, neither of them feel satisfying and both are quite boring. I'll go more into depth with other characters, but I genuinely think all of their moves are too basic and boring to talk about. I will say that they don't have the worst moveset of the DLC, but they're definitely down there. I think mentioning how much playtime I have for each character would be fun to do as well, so this is my playtime for Pythra so far. So I think it's safe to say they're not my favorite characters. They did still come with music in a stage which I did say I would cover. Their stage is called Cloud Sea of All Rest. I don't really like playing on it much, however, it's certainly not a bad choice. The slope and the fact that Gramps turns his head can be annoying, but this is far from the worst gimmick a stage has gotten. My favorite part about this stage though is just how good it looks in its omega form. The bright white of the sky and the general design of the platform just make this one of the best Funnel Destination variants. However, the main thing that seals Pythra in the last place for me is their music selection. In my original ranking of the first Fighter's Pass, I said I wasn't a fan of Fire Emblem's music, but post Violet's release, I actually think the music is the best part of that pack. Most of the songs there are really good, however the same cannot be said for Pythra. While they got a very solid amount of tracks at 16, I just genuinely don't find them to be that good. 
They're mostly just not bad, but there isn't a song here that I'd go out of my way to listen to. This is what I'd say is the second worst music selection of the Challenger packs, only really being saved due to the amount here and the fact it did get three remixes. So as a whole, nothing in this pack is the single worst thing in any category, however all of them but the stage are really close to it, making the overall package, in my opinion, the worst Smash Ultimate got. Alright, enough stalling, let's get to Byleth now. <laughs> Well, everyone knew this was going to be low on the list, so let's just make this one quick. Byleth was the 8th Fire Emblem character added to the game. Excluding Echoes, they're the 6th. Xenoblade and Final Fantasy both only had one character before the Fighters passes, so as a character choice, Byleth is easily the worst. Fire Emblem is simply not as popular as a representation on the roster may make you believe. I mean, they have more characters than Zelda, Kirby, Animal Crossing, and so on. I mean, sure, Kirby and Animal Crossing are far more popular, but their characters aren't as suited for fighting, but there's really no reason why Fire Emblem should have more than Zelda. Since we knew the DLC characters were decided before Three Houses released, the game Byleth is from, it's obvious that they weren't added due to fans wanting them. They're purely advertisements, which are the worst type of Smash character. So with that rant out of the way, what makes him get the edge against Pithra? Well, Kylo Ren's moveset is actually pretty decent, albeit kinda basic. They're pretty much the only character from the DLC that didn't get some crazy gimmick, however, that's not really a bad thing. For someone who loves playing Mario, simple can often be very good. Violet's combo game is pretty decent. The only thing I'd say is that up air is way stronger than it feels. Using the move to me always felt like it was going to be a weak hit, but it's a really strong kill option, which never felt right to me. His other moves do pack a serious punch though, which can make him frustrating to fight against, but playing as them is at least a bit entertaining. The recovery is still so stupid, by the way. I have no clue why they gave that thing more range than all of the other tethers combined. Unfortunately, their moveset was not enough to stop them from being my least played DLC character. Though they are probably only losing to the last two because I probably get Pithra more at random. Before we move on to the stage, I do want to say that their alternate costumes are pretty solid as well. Having the other gender option is always good, and most of the colors are great as well. Anyways, their stage, Garrig Monk Monastery, is just okay. A lot of work clearly went into this stage as it's one of the biggest of the DLC. Just don't look at the NPCs. The normal variant just isn't really too fun to play on though because of it being a transforming stage. However, the Omega form once again does look pretty good. I do prefer the Cloud Sea of All Rest, but this certainly isn't bad. And now for the easily best part of Byleth's pack, the music. It may have only come with 11 songs, two of which just being Japanese versions of the same song, however the tracks are really good. The main theme and the Edge of Dawn are my favorites, but the other seven are very solid choices as well. So overall, Byleth may have been the worst character choice of the DLC by a large amount, but their decent moveset, decent stage, and pretty good song list did save them from being last place. Alright, one more real negative character to go. <laughs> Time for the final first party DLC challenger pack, Min Min. This is our first character from a franchise that wasn't represented in Smash with a fighter already, that being ARMS. You would think that would make this more exciting, but it really didn't. Pretty much everyone expected an ARMS character to be in the game at launch due to it being from Nintendo, however when there wasn't, almost everybody had forgotten about them. Unlike Splatoon, ARMS never really got too popular and by the time Min Min was announced, no one was really playing the game. ARMS was a very polarizing title, so while I do think Min Min was a better choice than the last two, she still wasn't too exciting. Now then, we have to talk about her moveset and, uh, oh boy, she has the worst out of any DLC character in Smash Ultimate. With her stretchy arms, she has some of the longest reach out of any character in the game, making her one of the most annoying to fight. On top of that, she might just have the least amount of moves in the franchise. To simulate the style of arms, she has her A attacks tied to her main arm and her specials tied to her secondary arm. Most of the attacks look exactly the same, and if you're playing against her, forward smash is really all you're going to be able to see. Playing as her isn't really much fun either though, she doesn't have any combos that aren't just two forward smashes, meaning the gameplay with her is pretty boring. Luckily her recovery is one of the worst in the game, so it makes edgeguarding an essential, which is something I do enjoy doing. But her onstage game is just too brainless and annoying for me to like her as a character. She even has one of the best out of shield options in the game with her up smash, which definitely should not be given to a character based around keeping the opponent far away. We do see a significant jump in her playtime ranking compared to the last two though. This puts her well above Byleth, Pyra, and Sora for me, but that's only because Sora is new. While her moveset is unique, it's unique in what I would say is a bad way. It does replicate arms pretty well, but let's just say there's a reason reception wasn't too high on that game. Min Min was, however, blessed with a very strong music and stage selection. She received a whopping 18 songs, the most we've seen so far, with most of them being pretty good. Particular highlights are the ARMS Grand Prix remix, the Ramen Bowl remix, and Name Redacted. I would even go as far as to say that the worst song in this pack is probably better than the best song in Pithra's pack. 
The stage, Spring Stadium, is also pretty solid, though a bit of a painful story. It's got a very simple layout, which is great for me as someone who likes to play on the more competitive side of the game. With stage hazards on, the sides of the arena will act as springs that you can jump off of to do combos, along with some platforms coming up from the sides. This is actually a pretty good gimmick, it's not intrusive at all, so playing on the stage with hazards on isn't even that annoying. The standard stage is a simple flat plane with a single platform in the middle, perfect for fighting. There are two issues, however. For one, the stage is very big, meaning it can be hard for 1v1s. The bigger one, though, is the ceiling. Yeah, this stage has two very, very small ceilings, which are generally banned due to them extending games with techs. Had these been removed, we might have even gotten a brand new legal stage, but as it stands, it's sadly not up to code. Casually, though, it's a very solid stage. So overall, this pack is very polarizing, just like its source game. On one hand, the character itself is one of the lamest choices with the lamest moveset in the game. <laughs> but on the other hand, you got a very strong music selection with a solid stage. Depending on what you value most, that could move her up or down for you, but I think 9th place fits for me. Okay, sorry, I'm uh... I'm just trying to prepare myself here. Please just keep in mind that this video is my opinion before we get into the next choice. Here we go. Banjo and Kazooie's Challenger Pack is my personal least favorite third party from the DLC. Now as a character choice, they absolutely deserve to be here. They were a platforming icon in the N64, which were unceremoniously taken away when Microsoft bought Rare. Luckily, with Microsoft and Nintendo's strong relationship with games like Minecraft having crossplay, they were able to strike up a deal and bring the iconic duo to Smash. Smash Ultimate was really about making sure everyone's requests were heard, with characters like Ridley, K. Rool, and Banjo finally making it to the roster. Well, everyone except Geno fans. <laughs> but yeah, Banjo and Kazooie were perfect choices. So that means literally everything else about their inclusion was what brings them down. First, the moveset. They're also among some of the most basic characters added in the DLC, as they feel like someone who was added in a long time ago. I definitely think that was done on purpose, however, what they do have isn't great. They're primarily a zoner character with their eggs and grenades, which means they're sort of boring to watch and play against. On top of that, though, I just don't find playing as them horribly fun either. Their jumps are terrible. I know this is rich coming from a Steve player, but I just do not enjoy moving around in the air with them because of how low this jump goes. Their combo game also isn't too great either, but it's not bad. A few of their moves link well together, but most of them are just too slow or don't feel great to land in the case of his up air. That does leave their gimmick, and believe it or not, I actually like this. Their side special Wonder Wing is a brutally strong kill move with super armor that's very spammable. Or it would be had it not been given a limit of 5 per stock. I really like this limitation as it makes Banjo players really have to think about when they want to use it. The move also has a good amount of lag, so it's not annoying to go against either. It strikes that perfect balance of fun to use, fun to avoid, and fun to manage. It's a shame I don't really like the rest of their moves much, but they definitely nailed side special. This is how Banjo ranks among my other characters in Smash. Certainly not bad from what we've seen so far, but pretty far from the top. Banjo's stage and music though do not help my opinion of him. He got the least amount of songs we've seen so far at a total of 10. Surprisingly though, this makes up for it by having the most amount of remixes so far at 7. The amount though isn't necessarily what's important, rather it's the quality of those remixes. In my opinion, I mean they're okay. The main theme and Spiral Mountain are very good, but the others are just pretty decent. There's nothing here that I'd say is an incredible 10 out of 10 track, but they're definitely still solid. The other thing I have to talk about, Spiral Mountain, I'm really not a fan of. First off, I know the stage has a lot of great background detail with so many references to Banjo and Kazooie, but the main gimmick here is not fun. The stage will basically spin around as the match goes on, which I have several problems with. For whatever reason, it just makes me kind of motion sick. The layouts aren't particularly fun to play on either, with usually a prime spot for camping just sitting off of the ledge for the stage. Spiral Mountain is also just too 3D sometimes, it can be hard to tell where you can even go. There have been several times where I've tried to land on the stage, only for it to actually not be on the same plane as me. Now yes, the stage does look nice, but when all of the other DLC stages look nice, it's not really going to help it much in the ranking. In my personal opinion, this is the worst stage added from the DLC. If I had a choice, this would definitely be the last stage I'd ever choose to go on out of the 11 we got, which does hurt this pack as a whole a ton. So for having a moveset that isn't too interesting and my personal least favorite stage of the DLC, but being saved by a great character choice and solid music, Banjo and Kazooie will be getting 8th place on the list as my least favorite third party character pack. Radical. Going down the list chronologically here, we've hit who I think is the most obscure character from the DLC, Terry Bogard. From what people say, he's decently popular in other places of the world, but he's the only character I had never heard of before they were announced, besides my research after he was leaked. 
For that reason, I wasn't super excited for him as a character choice. However, that doesn't mean he's bad. Now, he's nowhere near as good as Banjo because Terry really wasn't requested much, but he's at least better than Pithra and Byleth, so we'll give him that. Coming from the Fatal Fury series, Terry plays like the other fighting game characters in Smash. This means he has the auto turnaround mechanic, which I'm personally kind of mixed on. It is more accurate to the home series, which is a nice touch, however it can make back airs really annoying and at least the players of these characters just mindlessly spamming down tilt or jab a lot without a care of which direction they're facing. Command inputs are something I'm a lot more negative towards. Again, it's much more accurate to their home series, but it just leads to so many missed inputs whenever I play them. Other than that though, Terry is pretty fun to play. A lot of his moves are quite simple and link into each other nicely, making it easy to come up with combos on the spot. And also, how can I mention Terry without his Jab Jab Power Dunk, probably the single easiest combo in the game that does quite a lot of damage. I find this fun to do and also hard to get mad at, so it strikes that perfect balance that Banjo's Wonderwing had. Now all of this leads to a pretty fun character, but we still haven't mentioned his main gimmick yet, his Go Meter. After reaching 100%, Terry gains access to two more moves with the rest of the stock, Power Geyser and Buster Wolf. These require you to use command inputs, making them a bit of a less fun gimmick for me. Bruh. On top of that, I just suck at killing people in this game, so this is probably the mechanic that gets me the most frustrated out of any of the DLC. I don't think it's a bad mechanic though, just bad for me personally. Some final notes on his moveset, I've always liked his Nair. It combos really well and the animation is just really funny to me. His moves in general are just very fun to pull off. Nothing crazy, but I just enjoy using this character every so often. Here's how he stacks up against the rest of the roster in terms of playtime for me. That's not everything though, as we still need to cover his music and stage choice. Well, I think everyone knows by now, but Terry got the by far largest selection of music out of any of the DLC with a whopping 50 songs. That's just an insane amount and it only comes as a bonus to the character. Just to put this into perspective, the only three franchises to have more than 50 songs are the Smash series with 113, the Mario series with 106 if you include Mario Karts, and Fire Emblem with 52. It's just crazy to me how many songs they were able to bring over with them. The amount of songs is almost the highlight of the pack. There's also an insane amount of remixes here with a total of 17. Now, I've been rambling on about the amount of songs. However, I haven't made any comments about the actual quality of these. And, well, it's honestly kind of weak. With how many songs are here, you would expect there to be more really good tracks, but only a few of them stick out as being memorable. The only real one that stuck out for me was the Psycho Soldier remix. The others aren't bad, just not that memorable. Doesn't help that most of the names are garbage like this, like how am I supposed to remember that? Now I'm sure many people are going to say that this is the best music selection in the DLC just due to the amount alone, which is definitely an understandable viewpoint, but I just don't find the quality of these songs to be up there with some of the other packs. As for the stage, King of Fighter Stadium, this is probably my favorite from the first pack. Upon first glance, this may just seem like a walk-off, however there are actually invisible walls surrounding the stage. These aren't just walls though, as they actually let you pass through them if you receive enough knockback. This is a fantastic way to replicate some of that standard fighting game style of a simple closed-in arena, but still smashifying it. I also love how they have so many different characters randomly appear in the background, it's just such a nice touch for fans of the Fatal Fury series. So as a pack overall, Terry is the first one where I'm positive on pretty much every aspect. As you can see, it's starting to get hard to rank these guys as many of the DLCs don't really have that many strong flaws. If it seems like I'm being too critical, keep in mind that all of the things I'm criticizing here are minor points. All of the packs from this point on are so good, it's sort of hard to separate them without looking at those details. Sticking with the fighting game characters, let's get to my personal favorite, Kazuya. As a franchise, I think Tekken definitely deserved to be in Smash, and due to it being by Namco, it just made a lot of sense that a character from there would eventually come over. Gotta say though, Kazuya being the choice was totally unexpected, but I definitely think it was the best one. Sakurai said Kazuya's devil gene got him in, so that definitely makes sense to me. While there weren't many people begging for a Tekken character as some of the others later on, this certainly was a hard character to be upset about. Onto his moveset, and there's a good reason he's my favorite of the fighting game characters. The two problems I mentioned before, auto turnaround and command inputs, are almost completely non-issues here. Kazuya is significantly slower than the others, meaning he can't really spam like they can. He takes a lot of brain power to play correctly, but he's also strong enough to play casually as well. Kazuya's command inputs are very hard to do, with his infamous electric wind god Fist being the poster child of that. I actually really like that about him though, it makes combos from that character very impressive to watch. He does have a lot of trouble approaching due to his slow speed, and he can get comboed due to his weight, so he does have some pretty strong weaknesses that the other Fighter Pass 2 characters don't really have much of. When he does hit you though, you're going to be taking a lot of damage. His forward smash being stronger than Falcon Punch makes this probably a top 5 forward smash in the game for me, it's just so satisfying to hit that sweet spot and possibly even turn a whole match around. 
His down smash spike is also very fun. It's one of the strongest in the game, and it makes standing over the ledge as him feel very powerful. His side special is fun to use, along with the trip of his diagonal backwards tilt. Finally, his up special has a surprisingly strong hitbox that makes it a great out of shield option to take a stock if you might be struggling. Aside from that, I guess the only real negative thing about his moveset is that he's pretty hard to combo with if you don't practice him. Pretty much every other DLC you can pick up and play, but Kazuya is the single hardest one. While it does make him more impressive to watch, it just takes a slight bit away from playing him since he can really struggle if you aren't playing optimally. This is how he currently stands on my playtime ranking, though I'm sure he'll soon pass Terry. Also, I want to say that Kazuya's alternate costumes are really good as well. They give him his main look from the original Tekken and his suit from the newest one. I know I haven't been mentioning alt costumes much because the last few character's alts really were nothing special, but I have a lot more to say on the rest of them. I think my favorite is the purple suit, but most of the alts here are pretty good. The gold one kind of sucks though, I really do not like the hair, but all of the others are good. That brings us to the song list and stage. Kazuya got the second highest number of songs with a humongous 39. While it's not quite as much as Terry, this amount is still absurdly high. Like I said with Terry though, quality is what's important, and I think these are certainly a step up. While still not quite on the level as some others later on, there are several more standout tracks here. No Easy Way Out, the Kazuya Mishima theme, and of course Yodeling and Meadow Hill are some of my favorites, but the rest of the songs here are pretty solid. There is one thing about his music though that pains me to no end. Now I'm no Tekken player, but if there's one thing I love about it, it's the song Moonsiders First. This is an absolute banger of a song and it luckily did make it to Smash, but only in the form of a remix. And you know, the remix is good, but I personally think it's far worse than the original. I really wish they included both, so it's sad to see that the original is nowhere in sight. With that said, I would still argue the selection as a whole is an improvement from Terry's, despite the lower amount. The stage is Mishima Dojo, and it has a very similar mechanic to Terry's stage. It has walls and a ceiling that will be broken if either someone is launched through it or they get damaged enough, rebuilding themselves after a short period of time. You can actually survive these ones once you exit them, however I really don't like this as much as Terry's. The satisfaction and zoom in whenever you got a KO there is just much more fun than this stage. The Omega form though is really nice, I love the dark atmosphere that I feel we don't see enough of in the game. The stage as a whole is very close to the King of Fighters Stadium, but I think I like that one just a bit more mechanically and visually with all of the different characters. That means the main thing separating these two packs did happen to be the characters themselves, and I just happen to prefer Kazuya. These two fighting game challenger packs are certainly very close though. So before we get to number 5, I did mention that I'd say where I'd put Piranha Plant if he qualified for this list, and this is where he'd be. Despite being an iconic character, absolutely no one saw this coming due to him just being a basic Mario enemy. And out of all of them, they picked the mostly stationary plant, which just made this one of the funniest characters ever added to the game. His moveset is pretty fun as well, with Patui being the obvious highlight. This is where he currently places in my playtime ranking. Alright, let's get back to the actual video. Our newest, and of course final Smash Ultimate character, Sora, is up. Now I could very well see this just being recency bias, especially since I'm writing this only two days after his launch, but I find him to be a ton of fun to play as. Let's talk about the character himself first. Obviously, he's an amazing pick for the game. Kingdom Hearts is a very popular franchise, and it turns out the Sora just happened to be the most requested character on the fighter ballot. I've never played the original series, but even I think he was the best character to end us on. Him being owned in part by Disney just made it seem like he was going to be an impossible character, even after all we've seen. So many people's dreams came true with this character, so that already boosts him a ton. As someone who has no attachment to the series though, what's important to me is his moveset, and luckily he delivers. Sora doesn't technically have any crazy gimmicks in the same sense as Steve, Terry, and the others, instead what makes him very unique are his wonky physics. While he is quite slow on the ground, this character is a menace in the air. His jumps are not only incredibly floaty, but they go super high as well. This makes him just a really fun character to edgeguard with, despite not even having a spike. His double jump takes a lot of time to get used to, but I think it's kind of a fun challenge. It reminds me of Mewtwo in a way, who's already one of my favorite characters to play as. Sword fighters can be fun as well, so combining the concepts just lead to a fun character. The air movement isn't the only thing of note for Sora though, as several of his moves, namely jab, forward tilt, forward air, and nair, all let you press the button multiple times in order to do a small combo. This is easily my favorite part about the character, especially with the aerials, as it's just so much fun to catch people on or off the stage with these. You can also cancel them partway through, which can lead to some very creative combos. Also, Sora's nair allows him to gain height, so you can do stuff like this in training mode. 
Sora Smash attacks are also much stronger than I was expecting, especially forward smash, which was nice to see. I do feel like side special is a bit more limiting than I would have liked, but up special makes up for that for being one insane kill move. It works as a decent out of shield option and it sends you upwards, so it can kill pretty soon anywhere on the stage. Again, this could just be recency bias, but I personally just have a ton of fun playing as Sora and I'm super excited to try him out more. Obviously, since he's new, he ranks very low on my playtime list. I'm sure he'll eventually rise up the ranks in the following days though. Oh, and we have to talk about his alts, these are all really good. My personal favorite to use is Color Forest since the render just stares into your soul. That timeless river alt as well is just great. His special stamina mode KO animation is also just such a nice touch, it's really such a shame that this doesn't work in stock battles, but I mean it's understandable. That leaves us with the stage and music. This is unfortunately what keeps his pack from being higher. Sora only got 9 songs and none of them are remixes. I'm sure even getting music from them at all was a pain though, especially with Disney owning many of the tracks from there. That does unfortunately lead to a kind of lackluster selection in my opinion. It doesn't help that I personally don't find any of these songs in particular to stand out. Well, that is with the exception of Dearly Beloved Swing version. But apparently you have to have Kingdom Hearts data on your Switch in order to unlock it. That's really stupid, I'm fine with buying a Mii costume or even just the song itself, but paying $60 for it? No thanks. It sucks they put the best song in this pack behind such a big paywall. But anyways, that leaves us with the stage Hollow Bastion, which I actually think might just be my favorite DLC stage to play on. It's between this and another one we'll mention later, but what I like about this stage is that it's just very simple. It's set up a lot like Smashville, that the platform will not take up nearly as much space. In fact, the only thing I don't like about this stage is the really neat background shift on the final stock that won't happen with Hazards Off. I really don't understand why this is locked behind the Hazards toggle, it's purely a visual touch as far as I can tell. Maybe they'll update the game to change this, but I kind of highly doubt it. Hollow Bastion also has a really unique look as well that separates it from the other stages in the game. So this challenger pack as a whole is very strong, Sora himself is a ton of fun to play as, and the stage is one of, if not the best of the DLC. The only thing holding this back is the somewhat mediocre music selection, but other than that, what a great character to end Smash Ultimate on. Going all the way back in time to our first character pack, Joker. As a character, this was probably one of the most unexpected choices. I think like Sora, he was a perfect character for when he was released, as in a perfect start to Ultimate's DLC. It just showed people to expect the unexpected and that the upcoming characters were going to be great. This video isn't about reveal trailers, I already did a video ranking those, but his reveal really did help make this character seem like a great choice. Gameplay wise, he's a ton of fun to play as. He's seen as the best DLC character tier list wise and among the top 3 best characters in the game. His moves are fast allowing for some quick and exciting combos as well. I think my favorite move is his back air, it's basic sure, but it's a ton of fun to edgeguard with. For how good Joker is, you'd expect him to be annoying, however, I personally don't feel that way. Sure, I do think they probably could tone down the knockback on his smash attacks, but other than that, I really don't find him to be too annoying. Maybe it's because the players who pick him up do it just because he's good and thus don't practice with him much, but I find this matchup to be at least doable for all my characters. I'm sure a lot of people will disagree, but I think this is actually a fun character to go against for the most part. This isn't really something I've mentioned yet for anyone else, but I also love the way Joker is animated. His unique red persona effects just add on that extra bit of flair to all of his moves. Overall, this is how he ranks on my playtime ranking. Before moving to the other stuff though, his alt costumes here are pretty solid. I like that they included both his school and Phantom Thief clothing, though my personal favorite is the purple suit because it reminds me of PURPLE GAY! But I think my favorite part about Joker as a character is his final smash. I haven't mentioned any of them before this because they weren't really notable, but Joker might just have my favorite in the game. It's based on his all-out attack, but the best part about this is if the opponent is over 100% on their last stock, the victory screen will be replaced by his Final Smash screen ripped straight from the game. I love this detail so much, it's just such a fun one that they didn't need to include, but I'm so happy they did. I'm not really sure who else they could do this for, but I hope to see this for future characters. Now the character isn't even the best thing from this pack, let's take a look at the music and stage. Joker's music selection is easily the best from the DLC, and it's not even really that close. They got 11 songs and every single one of them is incredibly good. That's absolutely no surprise though, Persona music and especially Persona 5 music is known for being super good. The Beneath the Mask remix in particular is certainly one of the best in the game. I think Rivers in the Desert is my personal favorite, though Wake Up Get Up Get Out There and Last Surprise are obviously very good as well. Mass Destruction is also a great track hailing from Persona to three, so I'm very happy they went out of their way and grabbed a few from previous titles. Heck, even Joker's victory themes are amazing. They're ripped straight from Persona 5, 4, and 3, and it makes his victory screen one of my personal favorites. So overall, this is undoubtedly the best music selection of the DLC, and it's what brings us up above Sora. 
I think I may prefer playing as Sora more, but the music here is just so good that Joker had to take it. Joker Stage Mementos is also very solid. Persona has a really unique art style and that's on full display here, so it's always a treat to come and play on this on its Omega form. Its standard variation is also decently fun to play on as well. Certainly not a legal stage due to the slope in the middle, but as a casual stage, it's a pretty fun. I will say that I'm not a personally huge fan of how this looks with the Persona 3 Blue and the Persona 4 Yellow, but overall, this is a great stage. There's just really nothing wrong with Joker's Challenger Pack. It really went above and beyond in pretty much every aspect. Still though, the competition is super stiff, which is what puts this at fourth, but man, what a great way to start off the DLC. <laughs> We finally reached my choice for the best challenger pack for the first fighter's pass, Hero. As a character, the hero makes a ton of sense. Dragon Quest is one of the most popular gaming franchises ever, especially in Japan, so there's certainly a gaming icon worthy of joining Smash. Now his moveset. This is easily the best part about the character. I'll be honest, when Hero was first announced, I was not excited at all. His trailer made him seem so boring, but after getting to play him, my perspective completely flipped. First off, I already like sword characters like Marth and Roy, so all of Hero's basic tools are fun on their own. The thing that makes Hero special though is his RNG. I still find it so funny how people almost banned Hero because of these random elements, but that's what makes fighting as or against him so much fun. Playing as him and getting the exact spell you need feels so rewarding, and getting hit by it doesn't really feel that rage inducing because it's just so much fun. Genuinely, it's hard to get mad at Hero because of how much comes down to randomness. His main move is his down special command selection. With over 30 different spells, you truly never know what you're going to get. Kaboom is probably the single best projectile in the game and is thus very fun to throw out. Getting power and speed buffs through Oomph, Psych Up, and Accelerado make you feel so much more powerful than your opponent, especially when you stack them all on top of each other. Using Zoom while at a spot where you'd have no shot at recovering is just such a good feeling of relief. Then, of course, outside of his down special, all of his smash attacks have a chance of giving out a critical hit. Again, it's hard to get mad at this move since hero smash attacks are all relatively easy to avoid. Throwing out these moves are just so much fun due to that possibility of annihilating your opponent's stock at like 15%. So for these RNG elements, Hero is one of my favorite characters to play as. Heck, every time I play Smash with my brother, we always start off with a Hero Ditto just because of how much fun they are. Currently, he's my second most played DLC character. Oh, and on top of all of that, I think Hero probably got the best alts out of the DLC. They were able to represent four different heroes from the series. I personally like the Luminary, but Eredric, Solo, and Octo were all great choices to add in as well. Now that we're done talking about the character though, it's time to get into the negatives about this pack. Hero easily got the worst music of the DLC, without question. He only brought over 8 tracks, which is the second lowest amount, and not a single one of them are remixes. Are the tracks bad? No, but they're far from something I would choose to listen to outside of the game. Heck, even in the game I wouldn't choose to listen to most of these. They're all just so bland, to the point where absolutely none of them stick out at all. Luckily, their stage, I'm not going to pronounce this altar, is solid. It's basically just FD, but it occasionally has some platforms that float in. Certainly far from being the worst DLC, though it's still quite basic. This is probably the least unique out of the DLC selection, which is a shame, but at least it's not unfun to play on like banjos or too chaotic like violets. All of this stuff here is what keeps this from being second, however Hero was able to just barely pass Joker due to how much fun he is to play as. As I've said, gameplay is the most important thing for me and that's why I gave this the edge, though I totally understand why people might not like this guy's pack as much. Oh, and one more thing before we move on. Please add symbols for the spells so players with different languages can understand them at a glance. Thanks. Our final Smash Ultimate DLC character to come from a franchise already represented on the roster is up. It's time for Sephiroth. Now you all may be wondering why I take points off from Pithra and Byleth for being in a represented franchise, but not Sephiroth. Well for one, Final Fantasy is infinitely more popular than Xenoblade or Fire Emblem could ever dream of being. On top of that though, Final Fantasy is a third party franchise from Square, making his inclusion super unexpected. And third, he's one of the most iconic gaming villains of all time. Pretty much everyone knows Sephiroth, even people like me who have never even touched Final Fantasy. Another nice thing with Sephiroth being included in the Fighter's Pass though is that Final Fantasy finally got justice in Smash. Beforehand, the series literally only had two songs and the only spirits were for Cloud, and even then they were just his renders. Post-update, Sephiroth brought a ton of characters over and even gave Cloud some spirit artwork and a brand new Final Smash, which was super unexpected. Of the characters we've talked about so far, Sephiroth is the most iconic of the bunch, making his inclusion obviously very good. Onto his moveset, and yeah, this is pretty great. He doesn't really have any combos sadly, but his individual moves are just so much fun to throw out. The most obvious thing about him of course is the length of his sword, making him have just insane reach. 
I think my personal favorite move of his is his up special Octo Slash. It's pretty slow, but its hitbox is massive with pretty strong knockback to boot. It's just so much fun to hit with this thing, even though it's probably not the smartest move to be going for. His down air is also a fantastic reference to when he murders Aerith. With the length of his sword, it's able to reach well below the ledge, making Sephiroth one of the most menacing characters to be below, which just fits his character nicely. Some other simpler moves that I like are his up tilt, counter, and side special, but all of his moves are pretty solid. Sephiroth being DLC of course meant that he'd also get a unique gimmick in the form of his one wing. If I'm being honest here, it's kind of lame. It's almost purely a numbers buff, and unlike our send for Joker, it isn't terribly interesting to look at either. The way it works is by far the most confusing out of any of the character gimmicks. Like, it seriously feels random when you're going to get the wing. But his moveset overall is just very fun. A bit slow, but those individual moves are just so much fun to throw out. I personally do prefer to play Hero a bit more, but Sephiroth has a ton of other things going for him. Like for one, these victory screens. Easily the best in the game. As I mentioned, Final Fantasy only had two songs before Sephiroth was added in, and I think this new music selection is finally really good. Sephiroth also only got nine songs like Sora, though I find these to be much better quality-wise. Of course you have the two versions of One Winged Angel, but those aren't even my favorite tracks here. That award goes to Genova and the Cosmo Canyon remix. Genova is just such a great fast-paced song, and Cosmo Canyon's remix gets more and more addicting as you listen to it. The other songs are also really good as well, all around a very strong showing in the music department. The stage also happens to be one of the best to come with the DLC. Northern Cave is once again a very basic stage, being flat with two platforms off to the side. I have a lot of fun playing on this one's main variant, and its Omega version is great as well due to the unique look that doesn't really have any other stage equivalent. Now I have no idea if this is tournament legal, but in my opinion it definitely should be. Now I would normally end the segment here, but Sephiroth has some extra stuff that I wanted to add on. To make his release more special, Sephiroth was given an event to unlock him early, which was just so cool and creative. It was simple, sure, but I just really wish they did this for other characters. The main thing I wanted to talk about here is his classic mode, which is easily the best out of the DLC and probably just the best classic mode in general. If you all didn't know, I actually speedrun classic mode in this game, so this is something I actually care about. This route is a boss rush. It's sad that you can't really do this with any other character, but hey, it fits perfectly for Sephiroth. Now, if there's one bad thing about Sephiroth's pack, it'd have to be his alternate costumes, as six of them just suck. They're completely unplayable garbage, and honestly, they should have made these chat ults the default. Now I may never get a shirtless Sephiroth amiibo. But in all seriousness, what a great pack. But I think you all know who's number one. Well, this is it. My personal favorite challenger pack for Super Smash Bros. Ultimate belongs to Minecraft Steve. Even a year after it happened, it's still crazy to me that it actually came true. If you all didn't know, Minecraft is my most played video game ever. Heck, this used to be a Minecraft channel before I transitioned to Nintendo videos. It along with Smash Bros are the two games that I play when I'm not really working on videos, so to say Steve was my most wanted character would be an understatement. I grew up with Minecraft, and I genuinely don't think I'd be where I am today without that game. Many of us wouldn't be, it's the single biggest video game of all time, which is why Steve was easily the best character they could have possibly added in as DLC. Smash Bros is supposed to be for gaming icons, and if you think Steve isn't a gaming icon, cope harder. Now I knew that I'd pick up Steve and play him no matter how they implemented him into the game. I mean, after wanting him for so long, I just have to. What I wasn't expecting though, was for him to have my by far favorite moveset out of any DLC character by a mile. Throughout this video, I talked about how my favorite types of characters are those who can easily combo and come up with them on the spot, and well, Steve has the best combo game in Ultimate, by a long shot. His jab and forward air allow for long strings that can carry the opponent across the stage, but they require some strict timing, making them satisfying to pull off. His up air and up tilt link perfectly into each other, leading to super long strings. And this is all without saying what makes Steve such a unique character, in fact I'd argue the most unique character in the game. In order to emulate Minecraft, every single stage in the game had to be reprogrammed to allow him to place blocks. These blocks lead to just so many new setups that turn Steve into the single most complex character in the game. You can use them to extend up air strings, set up a wall between you and your opponent to get more resources, chain moves you wouldn't expect like up tilt to forward smash. And one of my personal favorites is placing a block a little bit above the ledge and using down tilt to knock your opponent into the block sending them straight to the blast zone. This is just barely scratching the surface of these blocks, but Steve has even more tools. I mentioned mining earlier, and this is just such a perfect way to implement some of Minecraft into Smash, allowing you to upgrade your tools up to Diamond, which packs a serious punch. I haven't even mentioned Steve's most infamous move yet, Minecart. 
this thing is one of the best side specials in the game. At the cost of just one iron, you get a move that kills, combos, helps you travel, helps you recover, and acts as a command grab, which is a fantastic reference to how they work in the actual game. And with how deadly Steve's combos are, you certainly don't want to get stuck in this thing. And that's still not the end of his moves. Up Smash is hilarious and perfect for killing with its fast startup and can even be used in the middle of combos. Elytra is also a surprisingly complex move as well, allowing you to gain significantly more height if you press down in just the right way. It's also fun to dive down from the stage's ceiling and use that momentum to reach the ledge. Even with Sora, Steve might just have the single best recovery of the DLC just due to how many options he has. Oh wait, sorry, his recovery is below average at best, I forgot. Down Smash is also great for hitting opponents at ledge and works well for edge guarding with blocks. Speaking of, Anvil is a great to use powerful kill move which combined with blocks can confuse the heck out of your opponents. TNT also has a ton of fun setups, namely this one on small battlefield that catches every single ledge option. I'm only just scratching the surface of what this guy can do, and if you can't tell, I love this moveset with a passion. I totally understand why so many people get upset going against him, but I don't care, he's just so much fun. He's currently my second most played character in all of Smash Ultimate, only being bested by Kirby. Not only is his playstyle perfect, but his animations are as well. He looks ripped straight from the game and that's exactly what I would have hoped for. It makes him seem so much more unique and it makes him so much more fun to watch. Oh, and his alts are at least the second best of the DLC, only behind Hero. Not only does he get to represent Alex, which was totally expected, but Zombie and Enderman as well. Enderman was given new proportions to work with his sides, which just makes his inclusion so much funnier. But, with all that Steve does good with his alts, he has one that is the single worst costume in the game. Instead of getting the iconic Tuxedo Steve, or even Harrowbrine, we got the monstrosity known <laughs> as Tennis Steve. If you like this skin, it's only because your big brother never let you play as player one and you didn't know how to change your skin, because this alt is just terrible. But other than that, as a character, Steve is genuinely perfect. I really don't think I could have asked for him to be implemented any better. This character was just a dream come true for me. I know people are going to say that I'm biased, and yeah, I probably am, but I really don't care. Steve is easily the best choice. Now that leaves us with the stage and music. I'm going to start with the stage this time around being Minecraft World. I love almost everything about this stage. First off, its main gimmick is having six different variants, a plains, first forest, taiga, tundra, mountain beach, and savanna. I'm so happy they went the extra mile here. They could have easily just given us a plains variant, but in order to truly capture Minecraft's worlds, they gave us six whole stages. These aren't just different in looks either, as most of them have entirely different layouts. The plains and taiga are both perfectly flat stages. The savanna stage has a single platform on the left, the mountain beach has a single platform on the right, the birch forest has two lopsided platforms, and the tundra has two symmetrical platforms on either side. It's a shame these stages are so big, because these would have just been a ton of fun to play on. In fact, I think these should at least be considered for team battles. Now these aren't just randomly chosen either, as you can actually select which variant you want to play on with the button combination. I'm surprised this is the only stage they did this for, I hope they add this for others in the future. Gotta say though, really not a fan of the name. I really would have liked it to be called New World instead of Minecraft World since that's the default name in Minecraft, but it's not really a huge deal. But now, it's time to get to by far the saddest part about this pack, the music. As I said, Minecraft is the most popular game of all time, and thus its songs are also just as famous. Songs like the title theme, Sweden, Aria Math, and so many others have just become iconic to gaming as a whole, which is why I genuinely think it's heartbreaking that not a single one of them was included from the original game. No one knows for sure why this was done, but it's theorized that C418 didn't let Nintendo use the tracks, and if that's the case, that's such a huge shame. I really hope he changes his mind for the next Smash game, if that is even what happened. Luckily, there have been new composers writing songs for Minecraft, which of course include Lana Rain. Pigstep is my favorite Minecraft song, and I have high hopes it'll be included in the next Smash title due to its overwhelming fan support. This time around though, Pigstep was likely just released too late, so it sadly missed out on being an ultimate. As it is now, Steve sadly only got 7 songs, the least amount out of any DLC character. However, I did say that quality is what matters, and despite its low song count and lack of songs from the main game, this is my second favorite music selection from the DLC. Every single song here is a banger, there's not a single one here that you wouldn't see me jamming out to. Six of these are brand new remixes as well. Many of these come from the Minecraft console minigames and Minecraft dungeons. I grew up playing these minigames pretty much every day, so I was very happy to see them come over. Clockwork Crafter, the only non-remix here, is just such a perfect fighting song that also has an ominous sound to it. Glide is probably my second favorite track here, as it sounds exactly like quickly soaring through the air. Earth has that adventurous magic of Minecraft. Toys on a Tear and Dance of the Blocks are just fun songs to jam out to. The Archillager is a perfect boss song, and that leaves us with one. 
Holland. This is my favorite remix in Smash without question. I talked a lot about this in the last video, but it took two songs that I really did not care about and just made them so much hype to listen to. The piano here is perfect and this almost single-handedly makes up for the lack of main Minecraft songs in the game. So, for being my favorite character added along with so many other great things, Steve easily takes the number one spot on this list. I think the great part about these DLC characters is the fact that pretty much everyone got someone. Steve was my personal pick, but so many other characters had so much excitement to their reveals. This series is something special, and while I doubt this will be the last game, Ultimate was truly able to live up to its name and become the best Smash Bros game to date. These DLC characters added so much to this already massive game to the point where it's hard to get mad at any of them. I just want to say a huge thank you to all of the people who worked hard to make this event possible. I really wish I could just relive every single reveal, to the hype of seeing everyone is here, to the surprise of seeing Piranha Plant, and to the genuine happiness I felt when Steve finally broke through that wall into the game I had already fallen in love with. I don't think any other game could capture that magic Smash Bros has, and I'm happy these characters were able to bring that excitement and joy to so many people around the world. Huge thanks to the Smash team. I'm really going to miss getting new characters, but as it is now, this game is absolutely incredible. But anyways, that's it for this video. I worked super hard on this one, and it's one of my personal favorites to date, so if you enjoyed it, I'd really appreciate it if you left a like on it. I took a lot of feedback I got from the original video and made this one the best it could be, because I truly believe that's what this game deserves. Now that Sora is out, I plan on making a lot more videos on the game in the future. I had been holding back a ton of ideas until he was added in. Next on the list is a remake of my best and worst costumes for every Smash character video. It was one of my favorites when it came out, but it has a lot of problems that I'm really excited to fix. My opinions are also completely changed, so if you've already seen that video, don't worry, this one will be entirely new. So expect that to be releasing soon, likely after the next video since I want to throw in a Mario Maker video since I hadn't done one for a bit. But anyways, dry bones for Smash 6, and I'll see you guys next time.